for joining. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to recruit volunteers to keep an eye out for hemlock woolly adelgid, an invasive forest pest that is killing hemlock trees in New York State and beyond. The St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario region is the last region in New York in which hemlock woolly adelgid hasn't been found yet, we like to say. It is our hope that those of you on the call will enjoy some hikes this fall and winter and check out any hemlock trees you may encounter for signs of hemlock woolly adelgid, which we're going to cover how you can do that today. Um, but to begin, I just like to give a little background into what Slilo Prism is. The St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management is one of eight prisms that span the state of New York creating a network of partnerships as an integrative approach to invasive species management. The network is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. SLILO is hosted by the Nature Conservancy and we collaborate with our partners like the Hemlock Initiative, who you'll hear from shortly, um, to protect our lands and waters from the impacts of invasive species. Now I'd like to introduce Carolyn Marshner, the Invasive Species Extension Associate with the Hemlock Initiative. The Hemlock Initiative is leading a statewide effort to raise awareness of hemlock woolly adelgid and to help landowners and conservation managers prepare for and manage this invasive pest. Carrie, feel free to share your screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Is it actually a presentation? It looks like it to me. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if folks could type into the chat whether or not they know what a hemlock tree looks like, yes or no, because that will guide where I go. I see one, yes, yes, great. Um, so, looks like a conifer. So the bark is rough, it's furrowed, it's brown when it's younger, but as the trees get larger, you start to see the red-brown underbark as the, the areas between those big ridges start to show. So the big ones look a little red-brown. The foliage is lacy and feathery and evergreen with short flat needles that are a shiny dark green. They have rounded tips and are oppositely arranged and they have this sort of X-wing fighter um, arrangement where you have two rows that are slightly offset. They also have this whitish, distinct whitish stripe on the underside on either side of the midwing. Cones are small and rounded scales. They're brown when they're mature. They, when they're uh, immature, they're cl tightly closed in a bluish green. They're a foundation species. They fill a unique niche that, um, that isn't filled by any other conifer in New York. Um, and are not filled by that many other, even the hardwoods, uh, which is that they really thrive in shady places. They're um, specially adapted so that their needles can, can pick up even the little sun flick, flecks that come through a heavy canopy and still photosynthesize. And that's why you'll see them holding their leaves way down low in the canopy because they're, they're adapted for these shady places. So we tend to see them on north facing slopes, um, in gorges, and um, in low lying shady areas. They support a lot of species. Um, they provide habitat and food for over 400 forest species. And um, a lot of them are coming to the hemlock groves for shelter because if you go into a hemlock grove in the summertime, the air under the canopy is up to 10 degrees centigrade cooler than the, the air above the canopy. And in the winter, it's warmer because it's less windy inside the hemlock grove. And so all year round, animals are seeking out those hemlocks for shelter. They also provide a lot of ecosystem services and um, a little bit counterintuitively, a lot of those services go to streams. Um, hemlocks take up water in the spring and fall when we have a super abundance of water and they are not as taking up as much water in the summertime, 
when we have usually drought conditions. And so having a lot of hemlocks in your, on your landscape helps to stabilize stream flows throughout the year. And what we've seen, there's a researcher at Cor Cornell that has done some modeling um, of watersheds with and without hemlock woolly adelgid in them uh, throughout the eastern seaboard. And those that have hemlock that aren't infested, the streams are less prone to flooding. Um, they're less flashy. So that means that when, when they flood, the levels don't get as high. So it's good to keep them on the landscape. They also help keep the water clean by filtering, filtering water as it goes through the ground to get to the streams. And they help keep streams cooler, which is really important if, like Frank, you are a fisherman that likes to fish for trout because trout really need those cold streams and without the hemlock in most of New York, it's pretty hard to keep the streams cold enough for cold water fish. So why are we talking to you and not just bugging DEC to treat all of their trees? It's because 76% of New York's forested land is held by private landowners. And so the decisions that are made on private land profoundly impact the health of our forests. They're the third most common tree in, in New York, which I was a little surprised. Um, I live here, down here, and you can see there aren't as many hemlocks in here. Um, but I'm guessing that if you live up in the Tug Hill region, that does not surprise you because there's lots of hemlock here. This orangish color is more than 60% of the tree trees by basal area are hemlock. And so you guys are the proud owners of most of the hemlocks in the state. And this is what Pisgah National Forest looks like. So what happens when you lose your hemlocks when they're a big part of your landscape? It's pretty startling. And they lost their hemlocks as um, most of the southern forests have because of this pest, the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is all what we're all here to talk about today, which is an invasive forest pest here on the eastern seaboard. These are all the places in the world that have hemlock trees as native trees. And HWA is native in every other place where there are hemlocks. But lucky us um, with our Eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock on the Eastern seaboard, we did not have an adelgid predator of hemlocks until um, the last century, until the 1900s, when the, um, some, some adelgid came in from Japan on a Japanese hemlock that was brought in probably for the landscape trade. Uh, it landed in Virginia and it started spreading from there. And because we didn't have a native adelgid predator for our hemlocks, they just didn't our ecosystem is not set up to keep them from becoming very abundant and damaging our trees. In New York, um, HWA arrived in the 1980s down in the city and started spreading from there um, through the lower Hudson and then into the capital region and the Finger Lakes region. Um, can you see my cursor? Yes. Great. So Rochester and Buffalo actually got their very own infestations through their own infested hemlock trees that were purchased probably at a big box store or something and were shipped up from an infested portion of the country farther south. Um, the the Slilo region is still completely free of HWA as far as we know, which is great, but it's it's on its way. So this is what hemlock woolly adelgid looks like. Um, these white cottony little balls on the twig of the hemlock at the base of the needles. And you're not actually looking at the bug. This is what the bug looks like. Um, it, that is inside the little white cottony balls. And this, it's, it's a tiny insect. It produces the cottony balls through these pores and this curly straw-like 
mouth part is what it inserts into the twig to feed on the starches that the hemlock has stored for its own use. In the south, hemlocks are dying in um, four years, up to 10 years. Up here we have some colder winters and so our, our hemlocks are holding on a little bit longer. When we have a cold winter, the populations of HWA are knocked back. Um, not eradicated and they just come back the following year. So here is taking more like six to 20 years for our trees to die. HWA is two generations per year. So the over summering generation, which lasts all the, it's late in the early summer, hatches as a crawler, grows to adulthood. During this long period here, they're in estivation which is like an inactive dormant state. And then they wake up in the fall and they start growing. So that, that over summering and overwintering generation lays eggs in the spring and their progeny don't have this estivation period. They go straight through crawler right into adulthood and they're, they're laying the eggs for the following years over summering generation in the early summer. So two generations a year, one that goes through summer, fall, winter, and one that's a spring generation. Wintering. So when they hatch out, they're called crawlers. This is really the only mobile phase of HWA. This is the only time that they can crawl around and infest a new, a new tree or a new part of the tree. And they're spread by birds. They crawl into little, under birds' feet, and then the birds carry them to wherever they stop for water next. Um, they're probably moved around by deer and other animals. They're certainly moved by humans. They settle onto the twigs, and they, then they, once they put in their mouth parts, they can't ever move again. If you take them off, they cannot reinsert their mouth parts again. So once they've settled, they're, they're, that's where they're going to stay. In the summer, they estivate. In the spring, they, they keep on growing. And this is what they look like when they're estivating. This is why we don't usually send people out in like July or August to look for HWA because you can see these are pretty magnified. Here's the little insects. They're pretty hard to see within, with, without uh, some kind of magnification. Then they grow through their four instars, produce that wool that's so much easier to see from November through June. Each individual adult lays 50 to 100 eggs. Why is it so invasive? They actually reproduce asexually um, on the east coast of the US. All of our individual HWA are female. And so you only need one to create an infestation. There are two generations per year, so you have two opportunities for exponential growth every year, and there are no predators that focus on HWA. And that's why we have these populations building up to such high levels that they're killing our trees. No HWA population control on the eastern seaboard. In the other places where HWA is where it's native, there are HWA predators that keep the population in check. And actually, we, we look for HWA on the West Coast looking for biocontrols for this insect. And we have a hard time finding it because they're so well controlled by, by predators in that region. So there are two options for HWA management. Um, the only one that is currently available uh, is chemical control and um, a lot of what my group, the New York State Hemlock Initiative does is research biological control, which is a very interesting topic, but we don't really have time to get into it today. So what does it look like? Um, it looks like this from about November through May, where you have these little white cottony balls. This is probably, um, actually this is probably midsummer. This looks like last year's wool. See how it's kind of um, spread out instead of being in a nice tight ball. This is probably last year's HWA. And so if you go out in the summertime looking, 
and you're in an area that has a well-established infestation, you can still see this wool year round, but you can see, you can't see anything on these bees um, because you can't see the HWA from this distance when they're, when they're over-summering. That's what they look like when they're estivating. We've been through that already. Here are some things that you might see that are not HWA. Spider egg sacs, they're white, they're cottony, but they're usually not right on the twig at the base of the needle. You'll see them other places on the tree. Elongate hemlock scale is white. It's not really cottony. It definitely makes the tree look sick, um, but it's on the needles and not on the twig. By the way, if you see this, go ahead and put it, report it because this is another invasive. Spittlebug foam is white, but it's foamy and it's generally bigger than HWA. Other things, you'll often see these little areas where there are a few dead needles and a little bit of white inside. That's actually the um, cocoon for a hemlock needle miner moth. These cocoons are an oak skeletonizer moth. Bird poop often does look like HWA, but it's more spread around. Pine sap can look like HWA. And snow. And if you're out looking in the winter, just sometimes you'll look at, find a little clump of ice and think, ah, is it HWA? But no, no, it's snow. So when you're out looking, November through May is a great time to look. Um, we, we suggest that you end the, your searching when, um, when the, the crawlers start to come out. And we actually send out a notification in the spring. We have another volunteer program um, that tracks the phenology, the life stages of HWA that are, that, um, that are occurring around the state. And when we start to see crawlers in the spring, we send out a, a blast that says, hey, we the crawlers are here. Stop, stop, stop going from one stand to another looking for HWA in case you spread them. Check tree health. Um, look for branches on the ground. Uh, porcupines feed in the tops of hemlock trees and they drop branches in the winter. It's a great way to figure out what's happening at the top of the tree. But mostly you're grabbing branches with your hands or reaching up with a ski pole and grabbing the branch, turning it over and looking at the underside of the twig where HWA usually likes to be. And check branches on all sides of the tree. Carrie, your sound went away. It did? Am I back? Yeah, you left off. Check the branches of the tree. Um, over here? Did, yeah. did, did you hear, turn it over, look at the underside of the twig? That's the part we missed, I believe. Okay. And then check branches on all sides of the tree because hemlock woolly adelgid is uh, notoriously spotty in its distribution. So you can find it on one side, but not the other. Um, this is what a healthy hemlock looks like. It's got these drooping branches, um, soft feathery look. And you see this in the light green color. Um, that's its freshly emerged lime green new growth. That is a sick tree with no new growth. Declining crown, dead branches, grayish foliage. There's that lime green new growth. It's really a, a dead giveaway for a healthy tree. You might look. <laughs> Um, it's good to look at overall tree health, to look at the canopy health and density, and report if you're seeing needle loss or lots of dead branches. And another thing to look for is what we call lollipop trees. Um, if you haven't been in a healthy stand lately, you might not notice that these look funny, but look at all these dead branches that go way up the tree, and then there's just this tuft at the top. They look like a Dr. Zeus tree. Um, these are these are trees that have had HWA infestations for several years, and this, this is what HWA decline tends to look like. So if you see a forest that's looking like this, that is, it can be hard to find the HWA in these because there's no low branches, but definitely take a picture and let Megan know and search wherever you can nearby to see if you're seeing any HWA. We already talked. So other pests that are good to note, hemlock scale, and you might also see this. Um, this is actually woodpecker damage. 
on a hemlock tree showing that reddish underbark. And then you can see these little, little like um, holes in the bark. This is hemlock borer. This, this, is, a, this is a pest that does not attract, attack healthy trees. It attacks sick trees. So it's not going to kill a healthy tree, but it, um, if you're seeing a lot of that in a stand, it's a sick stand. So if you find any, report it. You can, if you're doing our HWA Hunters program, you can use our online data submission tool. Otherwise, we suggest that you use the New York IMAP Invasives phone app. Um, and Megan is gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. So we have a couple of, we actually have four volunteer programs. Um, any, anyone is, is encouraged to just um, report positive or negative findings in IMAP. If you're out boating in the early summer, um, probably early June in your area, um, take a look at the, the, the shorelines and you'll see the hemlocks with that lime green new growth. And if you see a, a stand that doesn't have that lime green new growth, that's absolutely a red flag. And maybe take a GPS point and let, let us know or let Megan know that you've seen a stand that is not putting on new growth, which means it's not a healthy stand. That would be a good way to do a broad search for um, unknown infestations. We also have a phenology volunteer program. Um, and if you want to just check the ones, the hemlocks on your property, you can go out and check them twice a year and let us know how they're doing. Uh, that's, that's a program called My Hemlock. And that way you're not going out looking at different stands all the time. You're just visiting the same stand twice a year and just letting us know, is there HWA? And if there is, how much are you seeing and how healthy are those trees? And that is it for me. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, so um, all of the programs that Carrie did just mention now briefly, we'll be sure to put links to those programs um, to their website in a follow up email to everybody. Um, I have everyone who registered, I have your email. If you hopped on without registering, please do um, put your email in the chat box so I can jot it down to make sure that you get the follow up email um, and all of the information um, that will be in it. So now that you've learned how to recognize hemlock willy adelgid, I'm going to just do a quick live demonstration right from my phone um, to show you how you can report um, any observations for invasive species, including hemlock willy adelgid, using a smartphone. So just give me a moment to get geared up for that. Okay. So you should be seeing my phone now. Frank and Carrie, can you see my phone? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So I just clicked on the IMAP Invasives mobile app there. And this is what it looks like when it, when it pops up. So you can download the IMAP Invasives mobile app um, to your phone um, through the App Store, the Google Play Store. It's free. Um, just look for the icon here up in the top left with the leaf and the, and the um, insect there. That's what it looks like. Um, and once you download the app, um, you won't, when you first download it, you won't see all these little cards here. Those are the observations that I've made. It'll be blank, but you will see this interface up on the top here with just the logo and what I've got with my cursor here. Okay, so um, IMAP is an online invasive species observation database. Observations submitted by volunteers like you and professionals are used to help strategize invasive species management initiatives. Um, and it's really easy to, to create an account. When you download the app itself, um, what you wanna do is click on the three lines or the hamburger here on the top and open the preferences. Um, and right from the preferences and when you download the app, a little pop-up will come up saying, hey, create an IMAP Invasives free account. Um, which you can see here in blue. If you click that, if you haven't created an account already, it'll bring you to their um, imapinvasives.org website where you can just make a free online 
online account. Um, but anyway, so in the map or in the app under preferences, you'll want to select New York. I did notice that some of you were from other states like Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Vermont. So you can choose your state here. Um, but for most of you um, on the phone, New York will be your state. Uh, your credentials for signing in um, are your credentials that you used when you made the um, account, so email and then your password. Uh, you'll hit retrieve IMAP lists. This will just give you the list for the state that you've selected. So for us in this demonstration, the list for New York species. Um, you can choose to have them just the species list displayed in scientific name or in just the common name. Um, I use the common name. It's just easier for me, but you can use either or. And then you have the option to make a custom species list. And this um, will help you when you're actually making the observation, which I'll show you next. It'll give you a shorter list to choose from rather than having the entire New York species list. So you just click on there. Um, this is the entire New York species list. As you can see, it's quite extensive. Um, but I suggest choosing um, false species, which you have to, it's in alphabetical order. So faults I have checked. And then scrolling down for this example, Hemlock Willie Delgid is checked and there's lots of others that you can choose as well. Um, and then I just leave everything else to the default. I don't mess with any of that other other stuff there. Um, I do want to point out that there are some special projects that you can become part of. And to become part of those projects, once you create your account, um, you can go ahead and just email me and I can add you to it myself. Or if you want to, you know, learn how to request it yourself, there'll be instructions in the follow up email, but you do just have to request to be part of it or be added by by me. Um, but I just want to explain so here, if you click on projects, you won't have all these pop up. I'm just part of a lot of projects. But if you do choose to be part of um, a special project with us, you will have access to um, the Hemlock Hunters and the Slilo Hemlock Willie Adelgid monitoring. And there's a slight difference between the two. The Hemlock Willie Adelgid monitoring one is just, hey, I'm going for a hike. I'm going to look you know, for Hemlock Willie Adelgid. And I just want to report if I find it or if I don't find it. Um, and if you don't find it, it's important to let us know so we know that people check that area. Um, and then the other, the Hemlock Hunters, is one that the Hemlock Initiative and in Slilo put together. And that one's aimed for a little bit more detail. Um, and it's also to include just the presence of Hemlock stands and their health. So those would be the two projects that you folks on the phone would probably have interest in. Um, and then also you wouldn't have to worry about an organization. I'm just part of Slilo, so that's what that organization is there. And then you just hit save and then you're all set. And to add an observation, say you're you know, out there hiking, you've come across um, a hemlock tree um, and what do you do now? So this is what you would do now. Um, you would take a photo um, of the tree in question since I'm not outside. I'm just going to take one of my computer, but I do want to point out um, some tips for when you take photos. Um, it's really nice to have a background to put to put behind whatever it is you're photographing. Um, Sleo has these really nice handbooks that I'm happy to send you in the mail if you um, give me your address. Um, and they're just great to put, you know, behind behind the branch that you're taking a picture of, um, for example. But just for this example, I'm just going to take a picture. Um, you can only upload one picture using the mobile app, but Frank is going to share later a cool app he uses to get multiple pictures in. Um, you can also select from your photo library if you choose this option here. Say you took like a few pictures already and you just want to use one of those, you can do that. And then the next thing to do is to pick the species that you're reporting. So remember earlier how I said, you know, let's do a custom list that's checkmarked. So you'll see now when I hit the little um, box here, right here, this comes up and that's what I selected. So I'm just gonna hit fake species for now. Um, underneath that, you'll notice it says species detected, species not detected. So um, in the case of hemlock willie delgid, especially since there's so many hemlock trees out there, 
and only so many people out there looking for hemlock willow adelgid, um, we use the species not detected data to help us strategize where we need to focus um, early detection efforts. So when you when you come across the hemlock tree and you don't find white willing masses, we still want to know. So you could take a picture of the whole tree um, in that case and um, then hit species not detected. If you do find hemlock willow adelgid, you would hit species detected. And what that does is once you submit this observation, it's going to send off a, an alarm to professionals like myself and Carrie um, and let us know that, hey, someone thinks they found hemlock, hemlock willow adelgid, please take a look at this observation. So that's what happens when you do the data there, when you submit the data. And then down here, you'll see a map. Um, I'm at my house, so you know it's got me here in the area of where, where I live. If you notice that the lat and longitude say zero, zero, you may need to go right into your phone preferences and turn on your um, GPS location tracker on your phone and like enable it for the app to use it so it can use the tracker to, tell, to put the observation in the right spot. Um, you can also grab a hold of the little icon there and move it where you need to move it to if it's not in the right spot. Um, and then there's the projects that I mentioned earlier. You know, you would just select which one you're, you're submitting the data to. And this just helps us managers of the project um, better analyze the data and find the data within the IMAP database when you um, allocate it to a special project. Um, and then time searched, it's really nice to just put in there how long you've spent searching because we do like to um, give credit to our volunteers for the time that they spend um, surveying for hemlock willy delgid and other invasive species. And then the observation comments, that's a really good area to put, um, you know, stand information, like how many trees were in the stand that you surveyed, how many trees did you actually survey, um, just the things that Carrie mentioned earlier. Um, those are more important for the hemlock hunters project, but they're also important for um, the hemlock willy adelgid monitoring, just because it gives us a little bit of background um, information about where you actually search for hemlock willy adelgid. Um, so you could put that information there. And then when you're done with all that, you just hit save. Oh, I forgot to, to actually click it, so not detected. Hit save. Um, and then to upload it to the actual um, IMAP database, you have to actually select the um, observation that you're wanting to upload and then go back to the little hamburger, the three lines at the top and hit upload selected. I'm not gonna do that though, just because I don't wanna upload a fake, a fake thing, but I do wanna point out a little troubleshooting um, that IMAP is encountering right now. So then if it happens to you, you're not discouraged. Um, I'm going to select an older observation that I made and try to upload it here. Upload selected. And it'll ask, yes, you want to upload. And then this is showing an error failure. Um, I do know that IMAP is going to, is, you know, doing like a, a major upload tomorrow. So maybe they have things on pause right now. But um, our conservation volunteer on the line, Frank Williams, um, told me that if you see this happen, um, if you close out of the app or turn your phone off, turn it back on, it usually solves the problem. So if you see things like that happening, don't worry. Um, you can reach out to myself um, and I can communicate with the IMAP team if we can't get it resolved. But I just wanted to point that out because it was happening to me earlier. And we'll move on to some um, volunteer opportunities for those of you who are interested in volunteering for our hemlocks. I'm going to share my screen. Oops, which one is it? Oh. And just show you um, some of our volunteer opportunities that we have right here in Slilo. We've created an interactive story map that highlights the priority invasive species that we're looking for in Slilo Prism area. Um, I just have it on the Hemlock Willy Adelgid section here um, just to show it to you. So this story map here will show um, the ID characteristics that Carrie went over here as a reminder. It also has more detailed um, resources available at your fingertips that you can click on and just get more more details about hemlock trees and the signs to look for for hemlock willy adelgid and um, a specific protocol 
um, that our volunteer Frank Williams put together for those that want to do more um, detailed surveys for hemlock lily delgid and hemlock distribution. Um, so the map here, as you can see, it's interactive. Um, the purple dots here actually show confirmed hemlock willy adelgid um, observations from the IMAP app um, database that I just showed you. So that's where hemlock willy adelgid is. And as mentioned, we haven't found it in Slalo yet. Um, the green points that you see here are actual trails that uh, folks could visit that have hemlocks. Uh, near the trails, um, and then there's like directions if you click on the, the box here of like how to how to get to the trail um, and the name of the trail and so on. So it gives you some information here about the actual trails. Um, down on the same page, this is right on our website at sleeloinvasives.org under the volunteer section and then the volunteer surveillance network over here. On the same page is a sign up sheet for those of you who want to become part of our volunteer surveillance network. Members of this network actually commit to visiting annually some of the trails that are listed here in the story map. Um, so if you are interested, um, this link will be in the follow-up email and you can sign right up and um, become part of this network. The other opportunity I wanted to share with you is this challenge that we're putting out there that's going to start um, November 1st and run through March 31st, which if you remember from Carrie's talk is the actual um, time frame in which hemlock woolly adelgid secretes those infamous white woolly masses. And it's pretty simple. It's just take a hike, check a hemlock, share a photo. Um, we're asking folks to take a hike in the Slalo region because as mentioned, it, hemlock woolly adelgid has not been found in our region yet, but you can pretty much hike anywhere you want. We have put together um, an easy Google map for folks to utilize, the general public to utilize here that gives you information about the trail, um, you know, pictures, things like that, um, that folks can check out. Frank is actually going to give you a little bit more details about some of these trails during his talk, um, but this, this is available for folks. Um, what to look for in a nutshell also has a guide on the website for how to distinguish between hemlocks and other conifers and more details about what to look for. And the fun part is um, you can win some cool prizes. Um, so let me start my video here and I'll try to, I don't know if you can see me, you can win a cool hat. I got this awesome Slila Prism hat and then we have these cool pins um, with our logo on it um, and lots of other prizes that um, these partners down here that are participating in the challenge are gonna um, put out there. But to win um, or to be, be entered into the contest for a chance to win a prize, you have to do one more thing. <laughs> Not only do you take a hike, check a hemlock for signs of um, hemlock willy adelgid, but also post a photo. It could be a selfie of you, it could be of the tree, of the branch, of the trailhead, whatever. Um, and then just put in the post the hashtag here, virtual hike challenge. And that's how I'm going to um, randomly pick winners of these prizes um, on social media. You put it on Facebook. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now, Frank, um, who is our conservation volunteer, he's going to share with him his experience actually surveying for Hemlock Willy Delgid in the Slilo region and showcase some of those trails that I mentioned from the story map and the virtual hike challenge. Frank, feel free to share your screen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Frank Williams, and uh, I am a volunteer for Slilo Prism. I've been working with Megan, uh, I think it's about four years now, and having great experiences uh, uh, doing my favorite stuff outdoors, hiking and uh, looking for trout streams, which one of my favorites is right behind me there, uh, where I catch a lot of brook trout, location not to be disclosed, which is a time honored tradition of fly fishermen. Uh, but <clears throat> what I uh, uh, enjoy doing with uh, Slilo is going and finding places for uh, hiking with that have hemlock uh, stands in them. And I uh, typically in the summer, we'll go looking for the hemlock st stands to identify where they are, map them out. And uh, then in the winter, go snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, in order to take a good look at the uh, hemlocks and make sure there's no invasive uh, species, hemlock woolly adelgids, etc. So I live in Utica, New York, and uh, one of the great places we have for hiking around here 
is the BRIA system. BRIA stands for the Black River uh, Environmental Improvement uh, Association or something. And they've got several hiking trails. Uh, one is around Alder Creek, about a half hour north of Utica. And they've got cross country ski, mountain biking, hiking trails uh, that extend uh, over on Egypt Road. They've got other ones that are up on the uh, just south of Boonville, a huge Jackson Hill trail system area. If anybody's ever heard of Pixley Falls, they've got a hiking system down there and a whole great cross country ski area that goes from Pixley Falls all the way up to um, uh, Boonville itself. So a lot of great places maintained year round. Uh, it's all uh, owned by Bria or has easements on, on private land. So great places to go and many, many hemlocks. Uh, where I found some significant hemlocks, if you can see my cursor is down here around the Egypt Road. There's a beautiful trail that comes in from this parking area, goes up and right around here, there's probably a good 300 uh, or more uh, beautiful hemlocks right around that area. Uh, up here, a little bit farther on Egypt Road, there is a great system up here where it goes down into a gorge where the Alder Creek is there. And it's absolutely gorgeous. I got some pictures of that and uh, just great hemlocks to go looking for. So here's a little closer view of the uh, Bria map. And uh, uh, this is the Cherry Creek Trail. And this is the one I was mentioning to call it the uh, Creek View Trail. You go down here. And this is actually, I've measured it uh, on Google Earth, and it's about 90 acres of hemlocks. So just a beautiful place, uh, great to go hiking, mountain biking and skiing. Uh, I always say this is their parking lot. And uh, the picture on the right are the extremely, very, very hard conditions I have to work in because I'm retired, got plenty of time to go and hiking. So this is one of the trails in the Bria system, absolutely gorgeous place. So if you're out that way, I would encourage you to go hiking and checking out the hemlocks there. Uh, Carrie mentioned before that the hemlocks are always near beautiful streams. And this is the upper portion of the Alder Creek in the uh, area. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the apps I use because in addition to uh, IMAP and Vases where I make recordings frequently, uh, I also have several other apps to help me take the pictures or identify the areas where I've gone so I can get back to them again and uh, track where the, uh, the hemlocks are so I can do a return visit. So uh, a couple of the other places I uh, go to, uh, and if you're looking for places for hemlocks, one place to find out some good sources of places you can go is if you take a look on the DEC's website for the public fishing rights. Uh, there that you can download maps that will give you directions to them but they'll also show you the uh, areas where uh, the state has easements where you can go to the, either in state land or on easements to private land. So this is one of those. This is Little Black Creek up in Remsen. And uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous area that dumps into the, uh, I hit the wrong one, uh, dumps into the Black River. And the hemlocks here are on both sides. Uh, as you're facing upstream to the left here, uh, the number of hemlocks is not yet counted, and I'm hoping to do some more surveying there uh, th this year. And uh, I'd like to just go through quickly some of the apps I use that augment what I'm doing with IMAP and Vases. Uh, the first one I use is called GPS Camera, and it's available for a iPhone or for the uh, Androids. And what this does, you can see here, is you take your photo, it automatically puts in your GPS coordinates, elevation, uh, uh, gives you a little bit of a uh, idea up here about how the accuracy of your GPS uh, system is working, the date, the location, and time. And I find this really helpful when I take pictures of my twigs or the trees, and if I want to add more photos to the online system of uh, IMAP and Vases, uh, I can always go back and find these by GPS co uh, coordinates and keep them uh, a little bit more straight than just having them on my phone. So uh, that's uh, a great useful thing, not only for this, but for other pictures that you just want to, want to remember where you are. And see, the next uh, one we've got that I use is called Measure. It's an uh, iPhone uh, app. There's a similar one that's called Air Measure that's also very good. 
but I find it helpful that uh, when you take a look at the information Kerry is going to be looking for in the hemlock hunters, a lot of uh, people are looking for the DBH, diameter at breast height. So just aiming your phone with this app, uh, making a point to point, it puts in the measurement and then you can take a photo of it right in that app. And that becomes very helpful for uh, monitoring your uh, statistics on the trees. Uh, we mentioned before that the IMAP app only allows at this time one photo upload per observation. And uh, some of the information that you'd like to do would be a little bit more about tree health. So what I do is I take usually four pictures, uh, the twig, the uh, tree itself with the DBH, and then the canopy, and then maybe a wide shot of the tree. And I use a app called Layout, which is by uh, Instagram. And you pick the four you wanna put in, you put uh, uh, the different kind of uh, borders or uh, configuration you would like, and then you can save that as one photo and then upload that to IMAP Invasives. And uh, it's a pretty neat thing for uh, keeping your observation scored away. When I'm doing my hiking, uh, I always uh, uh, trying to figure out where I've been and also uh, figure out where I'm going so I don't get lost on some of these trails because they're extensive. So I use a uh, app called Basemap. And there's several like these. Uh, All Trails is very good. Uh, another one is Gaia, G-A-I-A. -A. They do similar things. Uh, reason I like base map is you can make recordings of where you've been, but as you'll see over here also what it gives you, there's a layer on the mapping that'll show you land ownership. So if you're uh, concerned about where you're hiking is owned by someone or you want to get permission from that person to go on their land, uh, you can look right here and you can see who owns the land where you're intending to go. And uh, you can also record things and uh, keep the uh, tracking of your miles that day and your hiking. And it, uh, it's a pretty neat app that helps out a lot. Uh, I'm not a uh, botanist. So uh, a lot of times when I'm going out and looking for other invasives, uh, I want to make sure what I'm looking at is uh, the right thing. So I use an app by iNaturalist called Seek. And what happens here is if you take a picture, uh, open up the app, uh, take a picture of the uh, animal, plant, bug that you're looking at, uh, it will actually identify it for you. And that way you can make sure that it is a hemlock, uh, it is the certain insect you're looking for or, or the certain plant. So it's a pretty neat app and enjoy working with that. So again, my name is Frank Williams. I'm a volunteer for SLILO. Enjoy working with Megan and Carrie. I've learned a lot from these people. And if you're interested in going out hiking some of these places or you need some help in the IMAP app itself or online or anything else, uh, give me a call at this number, send me an email and uh, I look forward to helping you and maybe hiking with you. No, no. Oh, okay, good. I do want to point out um, how important it is, though, like to actually report observations because the the most recent um, hemlock woolly adelgid finding um, in Lake George along the eastern shore in the Adirondacks that was reported by um, someone who was camping there, and that report is what made it so um, the parks. Um, that the park that it was at and their staff and the DEC could go out and check it out and actually act act rapidly enough to hopefully contain that infestation. So, um, you know, you, you going out there and searching for hemlock willy delgid and reporting things is very impactful. And I'd also like to thank Frank, who has been an excellent volunteer and he has done very thorough surveys of the trails that were showcased on, on our story map and in that virtual hike challenge. And I do highly encourage anybody on the line who wants to go hiking this season. Um, Frank is an excellent person to go hiking with and um, he, he would be great at showing, showing you how to conduct a thorough survey for Hemlock Willie Delgid. And he knows of some great, great hiking spots other than the ones that we've showcased too. So he might share those with you as well. Um, can I add a couple of things? Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, this the past winter was very mild and so is the winter before it. And what we're seeing, what our staff are seeing as they are out this winter is very 
abundant HWA. So we think it's going to be a good year to survey. And we also think that we're likely to have a lot of new finds this year. Um, so this is a great year to look. And to, to follow up once more with Julie Reed's question, um, my, my understanding of what would happen if we, we got a, a positive find in in the Slilo prism where, we're, where, where you're near Tug Hill and there's so many hemlocks is that DEC would be visiting to see if it really is HWA. And if it is, um, they might even have resources to assist the landowner with treatment. So I think that it's more likely to, to help the landowner than, than not um, to, to, have, to have that reported. And it certainly will help the entire region because this is this is one of the the more fatal invasives that we have and um, get it, and and we have good management for it and so if we get it get an early notification of an infestation it can be managed before it becomes a problem. Excellent, thank you, Carrie. That's a great way to um, a great message to end our presentation with. Um, if there aren't any other questions or if nobody else wants to say anything, I don't know, Frank, if you wanted to say anything else or if you're complete. No, all set. Uh, thank everybody for joining us. I hope you found it educational. And again, we're all here to help you and give us a call, give us an email if we can do anything for you. Have a lovely day.